This video was sponsored by Skillshare. After I wrapped up my Spyfall reviews, I decreed a Doctor Who ultimatum. This means that if this episode, the Nikola Tesla episode, or the Jadoon episode, don't reach a 6 out of 10 or higher, I'm not going to bother finishing reviewing this series. And I'm deadly serious. Why should I give this TV show so much undeserving attention when there are so many other TV shows I could be watching and discussing instead? There are movies I want to share with you guys so many other episodes of Who I could be reviewing, and I honestly don't get anything meaningful out of repeating my opinion of this never-ending catastrophe called the Chris Chibnall era. It has come to the point where I'm urged by my own sanity to move on to bigger and better things. Hell, I could finally learn how to use my video editing software like a pro with a website like Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people with thousands of inspiring classes including illustration, design, photography, and video. Make 2020 the year to explore your passions and learn new skills. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life, so you can move your creative journey forward without putting your life on hold. If you're like me and procrastinate more than you probably should, I highly recommend the Productivity Masterclass to get your life organized and spend more time doing things that you want to. Skillshare is also really affordable. An annual subscription is less than eight quid a month which is what? two pound a week? How many weekly face-to-face -face classes are that cheap? If you want to support the channel, all you need to do is join Skillshare today and get your two-month free premium trial. Just visit the link below and tell them Harry sent you. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the review. The episode rushes us into a scenario that we barely get enough time to truly soak in. We're introduced to the worst named character in the world, Hyphen with a 3. She looks like something straight out of a furry convention who I wanted gone as fast as possible. For the first time in the Chibnall era, I found Graham really annoying. Graham, my son, get in! <laughs> Gotta get your coupons worth, get in! Come on, Graham, Sam. Ugh. When I say rushed into the scenario, I mean it. Not three minutes in, the danger starts ramping up from within this security center in a linen cupboard. You need to establish what normal existence at this holiday resort is like first, and let our protagonists relax a little bit. I was hoping for some midnight vibes, but nope. The dregs are getting into the facility, and Ryan encounters the hopper virus in less than five minutes. This whole virus idea was so poorly executed as well. Their first mistake was making the virus visible, as viruses are renowned for being microscopic, and the second was not showing its effect on the teleport. So apparently, the virus infects the teleport that would allow guests to leave the resort, but it's not even established whether the evacuees were infected themselves or died from going through the teleport. It's just stated that it is infected and is taken as gospel. Then the Doctor begins bombarding these new and uninteresting characters with questions she'll never get answers to. The questions she asks are ones that naturally arise in the viewer's mind anyway. It's the show's job to answer them. The best episodes of Doctor Who are the ones when the titular character doesn't have a flipping clue what's going on. The problem with this incarnation is that she knows what's going on, but continually acts like she doesn't, never once being genuinely challenged about her beliefs. Ryan is also just as unlikable in this episode. He outright lies to this girl he's just met, pretending he's a pilot surgeon or something. She firstly claims to be a hotel critic. This in itself has a lot of comedic potential, but then she just turns out to be as big of a liar as Ryan and is instead just an unemployed nobody whose mum is in charge of security here. How hard would it have been to conjure up an oppositional faction to these terraforming hotel colonists and have her as the representative? Yaz was just as pointless as Graham. Seriously, what does she do aside from cockblock the two bennies, show up randomly with a tablet, and oh, oh, and 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 take care of the old lady Benny? Then we get introduced to this green-haired bloke named Nevy, played by James Buckley. This was the only thing I was looking forward to in this episode, and his casting proves to be a total waste as well. He's not funny at all. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't want to typecast the guy, but if this is him attempting some serious acting, I'm not convinced at all. He starts off by talking to his own son like he's just met him for the first time on set, and then the pair just basically become more tag-alongs. Dad, we're doing oxygen checks. 
As green as the hair on her head, Silas. I think this line just says it all. Can you imagine being told by your agent that they got you a role in Doctor Who, only to find that it's just running around some really bland sets in a green wig with the most annoying child actor they could find? You never listen to me! Do it yourself then! The monster design looks fine. It's just how they're utilised that I take issue with. Every time we see them, they're shot independently of all our other characters. It creates such a huge disconnect with the performers that it's hard to believe the creatures are genuinely there. Let me show you their first appearance as an example. We see this disposable security man shooting at blackness with cuts back and forth to a monster growling. This does not constitute action. It looks terrible. The doctor then continues to alienate the audience by waffling on about ionic membranes, whatever the hell they are. She somehow determines certain types of DNA are approved and not approved for this giant shockwave she's about to create, and essentially the Doctor saves the day in 13 minutes. Everything that took place up to this point could have been fleshed out into a full-length episode, but this is the point in the story where the whole thing collapses into absurdity. Somebody hacked the system. Oh no! The hacking excuse again? But the systems got hacked. Kane, this security officer played by Laura Fraser, packs all the remaining survivors into a vehicle. I'd have thought just holding out at the hotel would be a far more viable option for survival. Nah, let's drag absolutely everyone to the dreg pit instead. They all get given these silly nose stickers and an oxygen armband, which also proves to be pretty pointless. I don't mind too much that the Doctor was the only one whose oxygen ran out because she does genuinely talk too much, but it's ruined by what should be the most intense part of the entire episode. The Doctor breathes in oxygen oxygen that this dreg is giving off and gets her air back. Well, that was flipping convenient, wasn't it? The car gets stopped by a dreg trap whatever that means, where they all run out of the vehicle and run back into it again. How on earth can you build tension when every single decision that's made is so bloody stupid? Speaking of bloody stupid, I think now's a good time to mention the Benny woman because I think her inclusion makes this episode nomination worthy for various Raspberry Awards. It was this moment here. If those things have got Benny, we're getting him back that made me realise what I was watching was actually fucking terrible. Well, thank God for that. Where was I? Oh yeah, Benny talking to his soon-to-be fiancé outside the vehicle. I'm just trying to picture this ludicrous scenario that's going on in front of me. Benny is being held by the monsters outside for some reason and is allowed to shout his marriage proposal at the vehicle. The escape is a disaster piece as well. It starts with a dreg tearing the roof off the vehicle and no such creature is seen when we see the vehicle's exterior. Then everybody drops out of the bottom of the car to abundant safety except for the furry. The episode cuts from everyone beginning to escape straight to the doctor, the semi-final person, leaving the vehicle with everyone else running ahead of her. The doctor then gets to the mound where everyone else is and Fatty Magoo is still in the vehicle? What on earth was she doing? doing that whole time? Adjusting her tail? And then they cut to this diabolical shot of the monster. Why is it so hard to have these beings in shot with another person? The whole thing becomes a joke when they all go underground. Kane admits to killing Benny and the reactions of everybody else are just so unbelievable that it makes you wonder if any of them are genuinely fearful for their lives. Instant death would be preferable to being held captive by a bunch of dregs, yet everyone gives Kane shit for doing it, despite Benny literally asking for death. If anyone can, will they please shoot me? Un believable. And that quote-unquote twist that Bella is Kane's daughter, they are so obviously unrelated that it was painful to watch them act as though they were. The 
only thing they have in common is their propensity for violence. Oh, how interesting. What interesting characters they are able to make on this show. Then we get another poor excuse for a twist when it's revealed they've been on Earth this entire time. This could have been done in a far more interesting way, but instead it's just thrown our way in the form of a Russian sign. Now, I'm fine with its existence because obviously there's no TARDIS here to translate, but this then leaves the question of everyone else. Presuming that all the inhabitants of the planet are dregs, and all the other humanoids are visitors from other planets, why do they all speak English? Everyone then arrives back at the hotel, which just nullified them all going out there in the first place. Then we get more dialogue about how the Earth came to be Orphan 55, which wasn't really needed. They just took the Planet of the Apes twist and turned it into a preachy doomsday message about how we're not doing enough to save the planet. We can imagine enough reasons why the Earth might turn out to be hell in the future. The answer doesn't need to be forced upon us. Repent your sins is what this dribbly dialogue screams to me. And did I mention that whilst all this is happening, our protagonists are merely pushing a vending machine into a wall. Welcome to Doctor Who 2020, everyone. So much horseshit then gets flung our way that I don't really have much time to wipe my eyes clean. I feel unsanitary watching this episode. This oxygen beats the dregs thing? Load of old tosh. Yaz pulling a random cable from the wall spewing oxygen? Load of old tosh. This dreg here looks exactly like the rest, despite the doctor calling it an alpha? Load of old Tosh. Let's isolate the alpha monster into a room and lock ourselves in this conveniently placed cage and speak English to it and hope it understands. What a miracle. It does understand us. Mm, this isn't quite the five star on suite I was looking for, but I guess it'll do for now. And then everything gets blown up because they couldn't think of a good enough way to end it. But wait, it hasn't stopped yet. Kane is back to fight off the monsters whilst this murderously insane woman kisses Ryan. But it doesn't matter. None of this matters. It was all for nothing. Everything is back to normal. The most face palming aspect of all is that the inconsequence of this episode directly opposes what the doctor's speech prescribes. How can such an uneventful episode be so preachy about the consequences of not looking after the planet? So, did it suck? I think Ryan and Bella's farewell shots say it all. Seriously though, who is this garbage aimed at? Adults who still wear nappies? Can we just pretend like this episode never happened? Because as far as I'm concerned, this is the most embarrassing episode of Doctor Who ever. There's not a single scrap of this episode I can say I liked or enjoyed. And now I feel far more reassured in my decision to give series 12 two more chances before I give up on the future of this show entirely. I give Orphan 55 a 0 out of 10. Thanks for watching. As it stands, we are four patrons away from that Father's Day review, guys, so I've set another target. If we get 100 patrons, I'll produce a Rise of the Cybermen Age of Steel mega review. What did you think of Orphan 55? <laughs> Leave your comments below or join us for a chinwag on my Discord server, where we'll continue this discussion. Take a deep breath, Harry.